Welcome back to the DockerCon CUBE conversation, DockerCon 2021 virtual. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE. We have Om Mulchdani, Chogo founder and CTO and CISO of Acurix, uh, hot startup, hot company. Uh, Om, thanks for coming on the CUBE for DockerCon and, and uh, talking cybersecurity and cloud native, super important. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it, John. Thanks for having me. So here at DockerCon, obviously the conversations are around developer experience, um, making things more productive, obviously cloud scale, cloud native with Docker containers, with Kubernetes all lining up right in line with the trend that's now going mainstream in all commercial enterprises. I mean, developer productivity, security is a huge time sink if you don't get it right. So, you know, shifting left is, is what everyone's talking about, but this is a huge challenge. Can you, can you talk about um, what you guys do at your company and specifically why it relates to this conversation for developers at DockerCon? Sure. Um, so John, as we understand today, there are millions of uh, you know, code commits that are happening in cloud native environments on daily basis. Um, you know, in a recent report, Airbnb reported, they uh, checked in 125,000 plus times hem charts in a year. And what that means is that, uh, you know, the, the GitOps revolution is here. Uh, and that also means that, well, you've got your Kubernetes clusters syncing up with infrastructure as code, such as hem chart, customize, and YAML files, right? Uh, almost several times a day. Now, what that also means is that the opportunity to make sure that your clusters are being deployed securely by these uh, infrastructure as code templates and deployment as code templates is available before the deployment happens and not after the deployment. Also, uh, in order to reduce the cost for detecting security challenges, the best option and opportunity is during the development time and during the deployment time, which is the pipeline time. And that's what uh, we offer. We shift your cloud native security uh, posture detection to left. We detect all your security posture related issues while the code is in development in a design phase, as well as while it is about to get deployed. That is within the GitOps pipelines or your traditional DevOps pipelines. And not only we detect but we self heal the code as well, specifically infrastructure as code. So we detect the problems and we fix the problems by generating the remediation code, which we like to call it as remediation as code. The detection mechanisms are called as policy as code. That's the primary uh, use case that we offer. We help developers reduce the cost of remediation and also mean time to remediations for security problems. Yeah, and also save them a boatload of hassle too. Uh, going back and figuring out how they wrote the code at that time and kind of what happened always is a problem. Um, I got to, okay, so I want to get into this policy as code. You mentioned that. Also, you mentioned GitOps revolution. Let's get to that in a second. But first I want you to explain to the folks, what is cloud native security and what does that mean? And what kind of attacks uh, emerge as that surface area becomes apparent? Absolutely. So cloud native uh, security is a very interesting uh, new paradigm. Uh, it's not just related with one single control pane, like take for example, Kubernetes. It's not just that. It's also the supply chain elements that go into the deployment of your cloud native clusters, like say a Kubernetes cluster. You need to secure not just the application code, which is running inside your container images, but also the container image itself, then the pod, then the namespace, then the cluster, and also you need to do all the other cyber hygienic, hygiene related you know, things that you were doing previously. So with so much of complexity because availability of different control planes, you need to be able to make sure that you are doing security, not just right, but at a very, very cost effective, in a very, very cost effective manner. And the kind of attacks that we are predicting, we're going to see in cloud native world are going to be very different from what we have seen so far. Especially there's a new attack type that I'm, I've coined. I call that as cloud native water hole attack. What it means is that imagine that most of the cloud native infrastructures are developed out of a lot of different open source uh, components and pieces. So imagine you pulling up a container image from a open source container registry and that container image contains a malware. The container image can directly land into your cluster and not only can enter into your so-called secure cluster environment, usually the cluster control planes are not exposed to internet, but deployment of one supply chain element like a 
uh, malwareized container image and expose you an entire cluster. And that's what is waterhole attack when it comes to cloud native waterhole attacks through supply chains. So these are some very innovative and noble attacks that you know we uh, you know predict are going to come to our way in next uh, 12 to 18 months. So you say it's a waterhole attack. That's the that, that's the coin term that you made. So basically, what you're saying is the container could be infected with all the properties that it's containing into a secure cluster. It's almost penetrated like malware would or a spear phishing attack. It targets the cluster and then infects it. And so not only that, because your container images that you are pulling in um, from your registries, registries can be located anywhere, right? If you do not do proper sanitization and checking of your supply chain components, such as a container image, it can land in secure zones like this. Uh, so not only in a cluster, it can become part of a system namespace very soon. And, and that's where the risks are that, you know, you had a parameter you know, at least of some sort when it was non-cloud native environments. And now you have a, you know, kind of false sense of security that I have a Kubernetes cluster, which is sort of air gap in one way, like there's no exposure to internet of the control plane, control plane API is not exposed to internet. That doesn't mean anything. Yeah. A container enters into your cluster, can take over the entire cluster. All right, so that's cool. So I love that uh, attack uh, kind of attack. So back to cloud native security definition. So you're defining cloud native security as cloud native clusters, or is it specific around Kubernetes or what's specific with a cloud native security? What's the category if the if waterhole's the attack vector, what's cloud native security mean? So what it means is that you need to worry about multiple different control planes in a cloud native environment. It's not just a single control plane that you have to worry about. You have to worry about your, uh, as I said, Kubernetes control plane, you have service meshes on top of it, you could have serverless layers on top of it. And when you have to worry about so many different control planes, what it also means is that the security needs to become part of and has to get baked into the entire process of building cloud native environment, not a afterthought or it shouldn't happen after the fact. So you need containers for containers that watch the containers, security for the security to watch the security. <laughs> so it's, it, you, you gotta it, be, it's so how, yeah. let's get, we'll get to the, I want to get back to the solution, but one more thing on um, this one piece. So you're a CISO um, there, you have a lot of chops in there uh, from your background, I know that. Um, so if, if people out there, other CISOs are looking at um, expanding, you know, day one, day two, ongoing, you know, AI ops, GitOps, day two operation, whatever you want to call it, cloud native environments. How do they consider figuring out how to deploy and understand cloud native security. What do they have to do? If you're a CISO knowing what you know, what steps are you taking? It's funny that, you know, there's a big silo uh, today between the CISO organizations and uh, the DevOps and GitOps uh, teams. Uh, so the number one, you know, priority in my opinion that the CISOs, uh, you know, have to really follow is having visibility into their uh, developers so developers who are developing not just code, but also infrastructure as code. So there is a slight difference between writing Python code versus writing uh, say hem charts or customized templates, right? So you need as a CISO, you know, a CISO org needs to have full visibility into, okay, out of hundred developers, how many do I have who are writing deployment as code? And then how many of them are continuously checking in code and introducing security issues? Those issues have to be visualized while the issues are written in code and as they are getting checked into the repositories. So catch the security issues while the code is getting checked into the repository. And the next best, best stage is catch the issues while the pipelines are picking up the code from the repository. So CISOs needs to have visibility into this. I call it as shift left visibility for CISOs. So CISOs need to know, okay, what are my top 10 developers who are writing infrastructure as code? How many of those developers are committing vulnerable code? How many of these pull requests, which are being raised, have got uh, security violations? How many of them have been fixed? And how many have not been fixed? That's what is the visibility that can, uh, you know, provide opportunities to the CISO organizations to react. Yeah, and more things to put KPIs around too, to understand where the gaps are and where the potential 
um, blind spots are. Okay, shift left visibility for CSOs. You got the GitOps revolution. You got the waterhole attacks. You have multiple control planes. Obviously complex. The benefits of, of cloud native though are significant and people doing modern applications are seeing that. So clearly this is direction that everyone's going. The consensus is clear. So how do you solve this? You mentioned policy as code. Um, I'm kind of connecting the dots here. If I'm going to understand what's going on in real time as the code is in flight, as it's checking in, for instance, this is kind of in the pipeline, as you say. So this has to be solved. What is right. the answer to this? Because it's clearly the way people want it. No one wants to come back and say, oh, we got hacked or you know, developers being pulled off task to re-figure out what they fixed or didn't do. What's the right. policy as code angle? So, um, you know, of course, you know, there uh, could be more than one ways to solve this problem. The way we are solving this problem is that first thing, we are bringing all top type of infrastructures code and the control planes into a single uniform format, uh, which we like to call it as cloud as code. The reason why we do that, so that we can normalize the representation of these different data sets in one single normalized format. And then we apply open policy agent, which is a CNCF uh, graduated project, which is kind of the de facto standard to do any kind of policy as code use cases in the cloud native world today. So we apply open policy agent to this middleware that we create, which basically brings all these different control plane data, all the different infrastructures code into a normalized format. We apply OPA and we use policies to apply uh, OPA on this data. This way what happens is that we write, for example, we want to write a policy. You don't want certain parts to be exposed to internet in a given namespace. You can write such a policy. This policy you can run on live cluster as well as on the hem charts which is your development side of the uh, artifact, right? Because we're bringing both these data sets into middleware. So in short, one of the solutions that we are proposing is that different control planes, different infrastructures code has to be brought into a normalized uh, format. And then you apply frameworks like OPA, open policy agent, to achieve your policy as code use cases. What is the traction for this direction, OPA in particular? Um, obviously control planes, I get that. I can see the benefit of having this abstraction layer with the normalization. I think that would enable a lot of innovation on top of it. Um, makes a lot of sense. Totally cool. What's the traction? What's the vibe? Are people reacting to this? Uh, some people might say, whoa, whoa, hold on. Um, you're taking on too much, uh, uh, you know, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. You're taking on too much territory. Whoa, slow down. I, go, I, own, I wanna own that control plane. There's a lot of people trying to own the control plane. So again, it's a little bit of politics here. What's your what's your uh, thoughts on the, the momentum? What's the support? What's it look like? Yeah, no, no um, uh, I think you are getting it right, the political side of the things. So, um, you know, one response is that, look, we have launched our open source project called TerraScan uh, last year. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're doing pretty well. It's a full OPA based, uh, you know, project, which allows you to do policy as code on not only uh, new, cloud control planes like um, you know Kubernetes and others, but also the traditional control planes provided by CSPs like cloud security or cloud uh, service providers. So Terascan can be used not just for hem charts and customized, but also for Terraform. What we are uh, promoting is a open culture with Terascan. We want community to contribute, become part of it. Um, yes, we are uh, you know promoting a middleware here, uh, but uh, we want to do it with the help of the community and our reaction, what we are getting is very, very good. We, uh, in our commercial offering also, we use OPA. We have good adoption going on right now. Uh, we believe we'll be able to, uh, you know, work with the developer community to have this thing uh, going for us. I love cloud as code. It's so much more uh, broader than infrastructure as code and obviously the control plane benefits. You know, when I talk to customers, I want to get your reaction to this own because I really appreciate your experience and and leadership here. I talk to customers all the time and I won't say name, I won't name names, but they're big, been big in FinTech and you'll, and big in life sciences and other areas. They all say, we want to bring best of breed together, but it's too hard to make it all work. We can get it done, but it's a lot of energy. So obviously building code and getting into production, that is just brute force anyway. They got to get that done and they're working on their pipelining, but getting other best of breed stuff together and making it work is right. really hard. 
Does this solve that? Do you, are you helping solve that problem? Is this an integration opportunity? Yes, that, and that is true. And we have realized it, you know, uh, long back. So that's why we do not introduce any new tooling into the existing developer workflows. No new tool whatsoever. We integrate with all existing developer workflows. So if you are a, you know, modern, uh, you know, GitOps shop and you're using Flux or Argo, we integrate, TerraScan seamlessly integrates with Flux and Argo. You don't even get to know that you already have got policy as code enabled if you're using Flux, Argo, or any equivalent, uh, you know, GitOps uh, toolkit. Likewise, if you are using any kind of, uh, you know, say uh, existing developer pipeline or workflow, such as, you know, the pipelines available on GitHub, GitLab, you know, Bitbucket and other pipelines, we seamlessly integrate. Our motto is very, very simple. We don't want to introduce one more tool for developers. Yeah. We don't want to introduce one more tool for security. Yeah. We want to integrate. <laughs> Things, yeah. No one wants another tool in the tool shed. I mean, it's, it's like it's like really like the tool shed. They get all these tools laying around, but everyone again. This is back to the platform wars in the old days. You know, when I was younger, breaking into the early days of the web, platforms were everything. You had to build your own proprietary platform. It wasn't some open source being used, but most of it was full stack. Now platforms are interoperating with hybrid and now edge. So I want to get your thoughts on. And I'm just really a little bit off topic, but it's kind of related. How should companies think about platform engineering? Because uh, you now have the cloud scale, which in a way is half a stack. You don't really, if you're going to have horizontal scalability and you're going to have these kind of unified control planes and infrastructure as code, then in a way you don't really need that full stack developer. I mean, I could program the network. I don't need to be get into the weeds on that. I got now open policy agent on with TerraScan. I really can focus on developing. And this is right. kind of like an OS concept. So how yeah. should companies think about platforms and hiring platform engineers and, and to something that will scale and have automation and all the benefits and goodness of the cloud scale? Yeah, I mean, you actually nailed it when you began. Uh, we've been experiencing we've been experiencing now since last at least 18 months that, and if I were to specifically also, I'll touch base on the security side of things as well, but platform engineering and platforms, especially now, everything is about interoperability and uh, what we have started experiencing is that it has to be open. The credibility any platform can gain is only through openness, interoperability, and also neutrality. If these three elements are missing, it's very hard to push and capture the mind share of the users to adopt the platform. And why do you want to build a platform to actually attract partners who can build integrations? and also to build apps on top of it or plugins on top of it. And that can only be encouraged if there is, you know, totally openness. Key components have to be open source, especially in security. I can give you several examples. The future of security is absolutely open source. The credibility cannot be gained without that. A quick example of that is Cystic. I mean, who thought they're, they're going to be pulling such a huge, you know, funding round, of course, that all is on the background of Falco, right? So uh, what I'm trying to, and, and, and same for Celium, right? Yeah. So what I'm clearly able to see is the signs are that, especially in cybersecurity community, you are delivering open source based uh, platforms, you will have the credibility because that's where you will get the mind share, developers will come and, you know, uh, and work with you. Of course, you know, I have no shame naming fellow vendors, right? Yeah. Who are doing this right. And this is the right way to do it. Yeah, and I think it's, it's totally true. And you see the validation on that, just to verify your point, not that we're having a little love fest here on open source, it's pretty obvious. The, the end user communities are contributing, not the hardcore end users like the hyperscalers. You know, at classic enterprises are, you know, are, are can starting to not only contribute and participate, but add value more than they've ever have. The question I want to ask you is, okay, I, I would totally agree on open. As data becomes super important, because remember, data is only as good as what you have. And the more data, the better the machine learning, the better the data scale. Um, sharing is important. <laughs> so open sharing kind of ties into open source. What's your thoughts on data, data policy? Is this going to extend out into data control planes? Uh, what's your thoughts there? I'd love to get your input. We are a little, little bit uh, early in that thought. Yeah, I think it's going to take a little while uh, for, you know, the. Uh, for the industry bosses to come to terms to that. Uh, data lakes uh, and, uh, you know, 
data control planes eventually will open up. Uh, but you know, I, I see there is resistance in that space today. Uh, but eventually, it's going to come around. You know, that has to because that will be the next level of openness. You know, once the platforms, uh, you know, mature. Uh, as an example, right uh, today, um, you want to write, uh, you know, any kind of uh, say uh, policies for your uh, SIM products, right? Uh, you have uh, option available to write policies in customized, you know, languages. But then many platforms are coming up which are supporting policies to be written in languages which are open, and that's data which is going to open up, you know, very soon. So you will not be measured in terms of uh, how many policies you have as a product, but you will be measured, can you consume open policies or not? Yeah. So I think that it, it's going to go there, it's going to take a little while, but I think industry is going to move that side. It, make, it makes sense, get the apparatus built on the infrastructure side. Once you have some open policy capability, that's going to build an abstraction on top of it. Then you can program data to be more policy driven or dynamic uh, based mm -hmm. upon contextual and behavioral dynamics. So makes a lot of sense. Oh, great insight here. Love the conversation. Congratulations on your success. Love the vision, love the openness. Obviously we think uh, uh, data as code is big too. Obviously media is data, where Cube is open. We have, we have the same philosophy. So thanks for sharing. Love the vision. Uh, take a minute to plug the company. What are you guys looking to do? Uh, you guys hiring? Take a minute to put the plug out for the, for the company. Absolutely. We are absolutely hiring great engineers, you know, a great uh, startup mind folks who want to come and work for a very, very innovative environment. Uh, we are very research and development, uh, you know, driven and uh, have got various positions uh, available today. Um, we are trying to do something which has not been attempted before. Uh, our focus is 100% on reducing the cost of security. And, uh, you know, in order to do that, you really have to do things that previously were not done in development uh, environments. And that's yeah. where we're going. We're open source, uh, you know, big open source initiatives, we're big open source lovers, and uh, we welcome people come and yeah. apply for our positions. Reduce the cost of security, do the heavy lifting for the customer with code, and have great performance. That's the, goal, the ultimate goal, great stuff. Cloud native security, threat modeling, DevSecOps, shifting left in real time. You guys got a lot of hard problems you're attacking. Um, well, you know, some of the uh, good things uh, that we are doing is also because of the team that we have, right? Most of our core team comes from very heavy threat modeling, threat analysis, and threat intelligence background. So we have we are blending a very unique uh, perspective of uh, allowing developers to tackle the threats, which they're not supposed to even understand how they work. Uh, we do the heavy lifting from threat intelligence point of view. We just let the developers work on the code that we generate for them to fix those threats. So we are shifting threat intelligence and threat modeling also to left. Uh, we are one of the first companies to create threat models just out of infrastructure's code. We read your infrastructure's code and we create a digital twin of your cloud native runtime, even before it has been actually built. So we do some of those things, uh, which uh, we like to call it as advanced breach path prediction. Um, where we can predict whether you have breach paths or not in your runtime environment that would have been created. And then the holy grail, obviously, the automation and self-healing um, is really kind of where you got to get to, right? That's the whole, that's the whole ball game right there, you know, making that productive. Oh, thank you for coming on a cube here at DockerCon 2021 um, and sharing your insights, co-founder and CTO and CISO, uh, Om Bulchdani, thank you for coming on, appreciate it. Appreciate John, thank you for having me. Okay, so CUBE coverage of DockerCon 2021. I'm your host, John Furrier, The Cube. Thanks for watching.